If you tune into the news, it's not too uncommon for you to see stories like these. Brand new CNN polls revealing how Americans feel about the president, the two political parties, and the newest associate justice of the Supreme Court. The latest CBS News poll shows partisan division over President Trump's summit with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki. All right, I don't know if this is exactly worthy of a Fox News alert, but a Fox News poll that really isn't too jolting, but it could be a sort of a wind at the president's back. The, joint. the host will introduce the results of some survey, poll, or study, and spend the next few minutes discussing, quote, just what this means for people like you or me, generally sticking to a couple of routine themes. But occasionally, as they're introducing the topic or discussing its implications, you'll also see something like this even though they often never acknowledge it. That concept of margin of error is tossed in almost like an afterthought, but it's actually one of the most important elements of the entire poll. Because it's so underemphasized, there's a great deal of confusion about what it means. This becomes even more true when it's accompanied by something like calculated at 90 or 95% certainty, which is really unfortunate because reputable survey outfits like Pew and Gallup include such caveats as a means of being transparent with their methods. Like with Windows in really hilarious YouTube fails, sometimes transparency breeds even more confusion. So today we're going to demystify the margin of error. That means we're going to look at both how it's calculated and the underlying logic behind why it's done that way. And in so doing, we're going to see just how important it really is to these discussions. Before we jump into that, I kind of want to outline the conclusions now because with stuff like this, how you get there is equally important as, you know, where you get. I want us to all be on the same page with regards to the destination, so that way you can appreciate the scenery en route, as it were. Here's what a 95% margin of error isn't. It isn't saying that 95% of the data is contained within that range, and it's definitely not saying that we're 95% sure that the number we're spouting is correct. What it is, is a measure of the procedure's accuracy in the long run. It allows you to say that 95% of the samples asking that question will have the population mean exist within those bounds. In order to help understand it, let's get a narrative example going. Let's say that you work for the mayor of a city with 10,000 residents. He asks you to ask the citizens the following question. On a scale of 1 to 100, with 1 being not at all and 100 being very much, how much do you like your mayor? There's not an election or anything coming up, by the way. Turns out your boss is just kind of conceited. Unfortunately for you, he's not only conceited, he's also cheap. He hasn't budgeted enough for you to go out and ask everyone. He's giving you enough money to talk to like a hundred people tops. So you decide to run a survey where you'll ask a hundred random citizens their opinions and from there determine the answer. While a hundred people may not seem like a lot, keep in mind that with 10,000 people, that's 1% of the population. Honestly, I'd be thrilled to have a representative survey comprising of 1% of the US adult population. Like, there's what I would do for a Klondike bar, and then there's what I would do for free access to that kind of data. Anyways, the great part about making up hypothetical examples like these is that we can use simulations to really visualize our inferences and the results of them. Keep in mind that the numbers that we're using are mostly arbitrary. The outcome is going to basically be the same regardless of what specific numbers you choose. Let's say that the population's opinion can be distributed to look something like this. Since most people can't be bothered to know jack diddly about their local government, most people feel lukewarm towards the mayor, with the more zealous positions held by fewer people. Again, we can only afford to sample a small portion of those people, so we're just going to have to infer that the mean we have is pretty close to the actual population mean. But, because you're doing a random sample, you know that your estimates are probably going to be at least a little off there's a very good chance that the mean of your sample will not equal the exact population mean. I took 10 random samples of 100 people just to kind of prove the point. See how not all of them are exactly, you know, close to the true value? That just happens. You're never going to be able to give an answer with 100% certainty. That's the burden of randomness. So you reasonably decide, okay, I'm not going to give the boss a single point, because again, that's just going to be too variable. I'm going to give him a range of possible values, and I want that range to contain the true value 95% of the time. In order for you to do that, you're going to need to know how far off your estimate is from the true mean or at the very least, get a average sense. Fortunately for you, that's actually possible. Imagine if you had a lot more money, but your boss insisted on not just getting a census of opinions, but running 100 surveys because, I don't know man, reasons. You run your 100 surveys and notice something interesting. Here's the distribution of the population's opinion. And here's the distribution of your survey estimates. Notice how they have the same general distribution. 
See, it turns out that not only is your population normally distributed, the estimates that you make of the population means are normally distributed, with most of the estimates hovering around the true population mean and tapering out from there. This is called the central limit theorem. Back in the real world, though, you don't have enough money to run 100 surveys. You only have enough money for the one, because again, your boss is cheap. But just as you can see where the average distance your data are from the survey's mean, you can also measure the average distance your estimates are from the true mean. This concept is called the standard error. And fortunately, due to some really cool math discovered by a smart French guy named Bienemy, at least I think it's called Bienemy, I honestly don't know, you can actually calculate a decent estimate for that just by running a single survey. Now that you know how far your average estimated mean is going to be from the true mean, you can calibrate the probability that your estimate contains the population mean. These are derived from the fact that the distribution of survey means is normal. Because the normal distribution is so well understood, we know how far away you have to be in units of the standard error that we'll call t to encompass you know, 65% of the data, 95% of the data, stuff like that. So if you want to give your boss a range that has a 95% chance of containing the true mean, you'll find the distance in t that corresponds to that percentage and add it to whatever estimate you have. And for safety's sake, you'll also add it to both sides of your estimate in case you're either under or overestimating it. Notice how your estimate of the mean can be all over the place, but the bars will still encompass the true mean? It's only in the random 5% of the cases where the sample is just, you know, that far off that it'll fail. This range, which you tack on both before and after your mean estimate, after translating it out of units t back into the units of your analysis, is called the margin of error. The whole bar, the plus and minus bit, is called a confidence interval. That was admittedly a lot of math and theory, but after ingesting all of it, let's think about what you can tell your boss. You can't tell your boss, I'm 95% certain that the answer I gave you is correct, because you know that sampling is inherently uncertain. So uncertain, in fact, that you had to calculate an entire interval as opposed to giving a specific number. And if you think back on the original data, you know darn well that 95% of the sample's responses don't exist between these two bounds, so you can't tell your boss that either. What you can tell him is that the procedure you devise has a 95% chance of spitting out an interval that contains the true feelings of his constituents which is something that can be really easily visualized with this figure. I simulated 100 survey samples from our town of 10,000 and calculated the 95% margin of error for all of them. Under the processes that we talked about, roughly five of the intervals should not contain the true population mean. And that's about what we find. Now, in our case, we got eight, but that's close enough to five to make sense, considering that, again, it's all predicated on randomness. That 5% is a long-run probability. This visualization also helps tell us that we can't say where in our estimated range the true population mean is going to be, you know, in the 95% of cases where the interval happens to contain it. Sometimes the mean that we estimate is lower than the true mean, sometimes it's higher. And you don't know, based off a single survey, which way you're going to lean. The confidence interval says that the mean is probably somewhere in this range. It's totally agnostic as to where it is specifically. You may be tempted to tell your boss that there's a 95% probability that the particular confidence interval you offer him contains the population mean, which you technically can't, but in practice you're okay saying in the limited confines of public opinion polling. This is because the 95% certainty statement comes after you've seen the data themselves, and that changes things up a bit. You would need a whole other kind of statistical inference, one that takes prior knowledge into account in order to tackle that question. However, in practice, the kinds of maths that you use to answer that question tends to construct an identical interval to the confidence interval, since we use uninformative priors generally in public opinion research. So you can say that there's a 95% probability that this interval contains the true mean, but be aware that it is not the confidence interval itself that allows you to do that. Don't worry if the term uninformative prior doesn't make a lick of sense here. That's mostly just to cover my ass if an actual statistician happened across this video. I honestly debated whether I was going to include that little rant here, but I decided that I'd be transgressing that very blurry line between simplifying and lying if I didn't. So when you see a news story saying something like 65.5% of Republicans believe this or 59.7% of Democrats believe that, you yourself shouldn't believe it. Because surveys don't calculate population means. They calculate intervals which, hopefully, contain the true mean. Without the information contained in the thing that they apparently see as an afterthought, those providing you with the stories are actually providing you, and themselves are actually reacting to, something with zero truly useful information. 
And if that just isn't emblematic of cable news in the US right now, then shoot, I have no idea what is. I'm curious to see what you guys think about confidence intervals, the logic underlying surveys, and other things like that, or thoughts that cropped up while watching this video or suggestions for future topics. I'm more than happy to answer those down in the comment section below. Look forward to reading all of them, answering a few of them in next week's office hours. Last week we talked about propinquity and the good place, so let's get into some of the comments on that. Case and Sylvia agreed that the idea of proximity playing a big role in Michael's transformation, and noting that he still actually tortured Chidi with the trolley problem, so it wasn't just like Chidi giving him, you know, this new way forward. He also noted the theory about how people going through some form of extreme uh, experience or some sort of trauma can bond from that. Both are really excellent additions to the conversation, and I agree with them entirely. Eric Schmidt also watched the Wisecrack video that I cited and suggested that being good might have something to do with like neurological development as well, you know, the idea of, of good things as, as being often rewarding and reinforcing the connections made in our brain. I think that that's a really interesting theory and kind of promotes the idea that goodness is a trait that is fundamentally practice, and that personally appeals to me. It also resonates more with the kind of Aristotelian conclusion that Wisecrack came down on, so yeah, I definitely think that there, there's something to that position. And that's all the time that we have for this week. Thank you guys so much for your comments. Please, please, please keep them coming. Links for everything as always we talked about will be down in the doobie doo as well as links to the Facebook, Twitter, and the blog. Look forward to seeing you guys out there as well. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you consider giving it a thumbs up. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by commenting down below, by sharing this video, and by subscribing to the channel to stay in the loop for more awesome social science content is uploaded. If you want to be guaranteed to be in the loop when I upload a new video, be sure to click the bell icon as well. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.